pooling. And just for your information, um, this meeting will be recorded and now it's being live streamed on YouTube. And we are going to share the recording with you later on. So it's 14.55 here in Indonesia, Jakarta time, and we are going to start in uh, five more uh, minutes. Yeah. So feel free to open your mic and chat. Okay, so this is from Jingyi. Yeah, you can also write on our chat box. Yeah, thank you for holding this wonderful corpus program. You're welcome, Jingyi. Jingyi, uh, where are you from? Am I pronouncing the, your name correctly? Oh, we have Dr. Humaira, yeah. Jahangir Humaira. Hello, Dr. Jahangir Humaira. <laughs> um, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, uh, Jingyi. Yeah, did I oh, pronounce hello, your name? Hello, hello there. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, definitely. You pronounce my name correct. I'm actually from China, and I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Malaya uh, in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. Hopefully, or no technical issues at all. Yeah. So in case your connection is unstable, uh, you can try closing your account. So that usually helps. Yeah, so we have Dr. Jahangir Humaira. Dr. Humaira uh, is a graduate from Lancaster University. So a fellow uh, Lancasterian. Have a free hand through. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome, Maira. Thank you for attending this event. I'm really excited. And I was so looking forward to this event. I'm sure it yeah, will be yeah. really fulfilling. Thank you for inviting us, Dr. Bihan. No worries. No worries. Are you in Pakistan now? Yes, I'm in Pakistan. Mm, I'm attending okay. from here. Great, great. Is the internet connection all right there? Yes, it is fine. It is mm. perfectly all okay. right. We can hear yeah. you, watch you. But on the safe side, I have uh, stopped my video. Sir, sir. Yeah, it's all right. Because last time we talked, like, there was a problem about internet connection. Yes. Uh, well, which again happened at a time. Yes, especially mm. in our, our region, it does happen a lot. Mm. So we are expecting uh, Dr. Robbie Love. So Dr. Robbie Love. Uh, is one of the corpus linguists behind BMC, British National Corpus, a very uh, well-known uh, corpus, a British English corpus. Okay. Right. So uh, let me hand over you to the moderators, and I will <laughs> make sure everything is checked. Hello everyone, if you didn't have a bad connection, you can open your camera in here. All right, we're expecting to start our event uh, in, the four, in the few more minutes. And then let's me say hello to uh, Mr. Abdul Hakim, are you there? Hello. Oh, oh maybe he is no, uh, in a laptop. Now let's say hello to Miss Jenny. Hi, Miss Jenny. Can you open your mic? Hi, can you hear me? Oh, hi, yeah, it's clear enough. Uh, yeah, right. thank, thank you for inviting me. And I'm so excited to uh, participate in this meeting. Okay. Uh, nice to meet you here. May I know where are you from? Uh, I'm from China, uh, Chongqing province, and I'm a graduate student. And I am interested in corpus linguistics. And I know the uh, this meeting from your website. And I, uh, yeah, I'm very happy. Okay, uh, glad to have you in our event, and we hope that you are enjoying this course. Thank you, yeah, Miss Jenny. Yeah. 
Uh, uh, hi everyone. So Miss Jenny, could you change your background, please, if you do not hesitate? Uh, yeah. Uh, you mean the virtual background? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I'm exploring where to start. Uh, how to set? Then someone can give me some get. Okay, we are going to send again the virtual background in group chat. So wait for a minute, please. Can also check your we can, you can also check your emails. Email? Yeah, uh -huh. I have done, I've downloaded the picture, but I don't know how to uh, upload this picture as my virtual background. Where? Where should I uh, click where? Uh, all right. So for Mrs. Jenny and everyone, if you have uh, trouble in changing the factor background, uh, you can uh, click on your uh, video, maybe on your stop video icon, and you will find the option there. There is a uh, blur my background, choose virtual background, video filter, and others. And then you can choose virtual background to change your virtual background. Oh, all right. uh, yeah. But uh, if you guys still have a trouble, I think mm -hmm. it is all right if you do not have the same background like us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you mean in the sighting? The sighting? Yes. Okay, can you give me a screenshot so I can clearly where find I should? To okay, click? sure. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute. I'm not familiar with Zoom. <laughs> You know, in China, I usually using use the way uh tencent. Hello, Robbie. Robbie, are you there? Hi, morning. Can you hear me? Good morning in UK and good afternoon. Yes, indeed. Um, good afternoon. Jakarta, to you. Indonesia, <laughs> Indonesia. <laughs> oh. I saw a How cat you? behind you. Was that a real cat or was that your cat? Uh, oh, no, I think that's no, a that, that is not a real cat, but I do have a real cat who looks a bit like that. Yes, <laughs> he, may, he may well appear at some point. Who knows? Yeah, because I see you posted on uh, Facebook a lot of pics with your cat. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, How are you, Robbie? Good, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm very well. Very well. How are you? Yeah, good, good. So we have already a number of participants ready for your presentation um today. And it seems that participants are from across the globe, at least from Indonesia, China, Australia, and yeah, different um countries. Great. Uh, we got your you got your presentation materials, Ravi. So everyone, uh, if you are wondering about Ruby's presentation materials, we have uploaded all the uh, materials into the Google Drive which you can access. Okay. Great. And uh, just uh, just remind me, Priyan, sorry, you, there are some mm. introductory things that you uh, yes. would like to say, and then we're starting with my session at half past. Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's right. So uh, okay. as scheduled, so there will be an opening remark by Dean of Faculty of Humanities. And then I'm going to deliver the course structure very briefly. There's another view for the participants of what we're going to um, uh, um experience for the last for the uh, upcoming five days and yeah. then the session will be yours after that 
Okay. So right. we are still waiting for our uh, team. Okay, Ravi. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Help right, me. so it seems the our dean, Dr. Nurhayati M. Hum, is already here. Dr. Nurhayati, are you there? We are still have a trouble, a trouble okay. with uh, right. my laptop. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Good morning for all of the tutors, speakers, and also participants. But uh, good afternoon from Indonesia. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah. So, Dr. Nurhayati, let me hand over the sessions uh, to our moderators. So, everyone, uh, Cindy and Arga will be our moderators uh, mm -hmm. today. So, yeah, without further ado, let's start the session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Cindy, uh, Cindy. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to Deep Scoring 2023, a summer course on corpus linguistic brought to you by English Department of Diponegoro University, Indonesia, one of the leading public universities in Indonesia. As you know, Deep Scoring has brought together international students and scholars from more than 30 countries around the globe. We thank you for your interest in participating in this event. My name is Cindy, and I will be your host for today's session. Today's program will consist of three sessions, an opening remark, a course overview, and uh, also a course summer course session, corpus and corpus query system. Before we dive into the session, I'd like to invite you to listen or to join us singing the national anthem of Indonesia. Here it is. Thank you very much, everyone. Now let's start our first session, an opening remark by the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities of the Ponguru University, Dr. Nurhayati M. Hum. Ms. Nurhayati, over to you. Thank you very much for the Master of Ceremony. <clears throat> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Your Excellencies, uh, the speakers or the tutors of this summer course, Dr. Robbie Love from Aston University, United Kingdom, UK. And then the second one is Dr. Rafaela Potini from Lancaster University, UK. And then 
Dr. Andresa Gomide from University of Columbia, Portugal. Prihantoro PhD from Universitas Diponegoro, Indonesia. Dr. Peter Crosswaite from University of Queensland, Australia. Carlina Denistia PhD from UNS, Indonesia. Students and all participants of the International Summer Course Deep Scrolling 2023. Good afternoon from Indonesia, greeting from Semarang, and good morning in Europe, Africa, and Australia continents. On behalf of the Faculty of Humanities, Universitas Diponegoro, or we have the name UNDIP, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the International Summer Course Deep Scrolling 2023. This summer course is one of the most prestigious activities in our faculty. And I really appreciate of your participation, either as a tutor, speaker, or as a participant in this summer course. We are truly gratefully for this. This activity is one of our efforts to gain the predicates of world-class faculty, world-class university in social humanities subject. This is also one of our strategies to be recognized internationally. Ladies and gentlemen, we have conducted the summer course annually, actually. And each year, we conduct at least three summer course programs. This year, we are also conducting three summer courses, and this is the first one. Among the three summer courses we are conducting this year, this one is different because our focus of this summer course is to invite participants to learn corpus linguistic instead of learning local or national Indonesian culture. I will inform you that this program is attended by more than 53 participants from among 23 countries around the world. This is the great achievement in terms of country numbers. So in this opportunity, please allow me to give a brief description about the Faculty of Humanities because uh, we, uh, we know that the participants come from some countries. The Faculty of Humanities was founded in 1965, has 10 study programs consisting of eight bachelor programs, three must, uh, six bachelor programs, three master degree program, and one doctoral program. The study program cover literature, linguistic, history, and anthropology, library, and information. So the summer course is conducted by the linguistic department, especially for English study programs. We have Center of Excellence in studying local culture and society and maritime history and culture. For postgraduate degree, we are offering study by research. So the students can join our program, our studies from their countries. We offer this opportunity for you to join our program. So I'm so sorry because I have to inform this as a one of our branding. In this opportunity, I would like to say thanks for all of the tutor speakers of this summer course. I also would like to thank to all of the committee who have worked hard before and during the summer course. Thank you for all of the participants and welcome you here today. Please enjoy the course and don't be hesitant 
to ask us if you find the difficulty during attending the summer course. And with uh, this summer course, we hope that all of the participants will understand more about our faculty and our university. Thank you very much and please enjoy the summer course. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Nur Hayati, for your warm opening remarks. Before going to the next agenda, we invite you to take a picture together. Can you all please open your camera? You wait for some people. If you all open the camera, we can move to the next agenda, please. So open the camera. Okay, everyone is ready for the take a picture, please. For the slides one. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, slides two, one, two, three. Slides three, one, two, three. Okay. Okay, it's done. Thank you everyone for opening your camera. Thank you, Dr. Nur Hayati, for the opening of the summer course. Next, let's listen to the overall course structure presented by Prihan Toro, PhD, an associate professor of Corpus Linguistic from Diponegoro University. Over to you, Mr. Prihan Toro, PhD. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Arga and Cindy as the moderators. Hello, everyone. My name is Prihan Toro, welcome to the schooling, Diponegoro Summer Course in Corpus Linguistic 2023, hosted by English Department of Nagoya University. This summer course is for anyone without assuming any prior knowledge of linguistics or corpus linguistics, even though if you know a bit or if you know more about that, it will be good. The summer course will last for five days. The first four days will be devoted to practical sessions, while the last day will consist of Deepa Nagoro special lecture. In day one, Today, you'll be introduced to corpus linguistics and corpus query systems. Um, corpus linguistics can be further categorized into corpus queries and corpus processing and methods or analysis. But we here will focus on the last one using corpus linguistics as an approach or method. Instrumental to corpus linguistics is the use of corpus query system. And using such system allows you to handle a large number of data. For instance, with a single click, you can obtain 10 most frequently used words in British National Corpus, uh, whose size is more than 100 million words. Note that we have also sent you a shared CKP web account, username and password, which you can use during the summer course. Please check your email. I put the account in a file in the Google Drive. For this session, you'll be accompanied by Dr. Lovelo from Aston University, UK, a corpus linguist from UK, and one of the most important people behind the creation of British National Corpus. In day two, we will learn how to make queries. Well, this is actually not something very new. Imagine that you're searching for something on the internet database. You then use some keywords to search what you want to find. Well, not so much differences. You search uh, in the Corpus query system using some sort of keywords, but using corpora as your database. Some queries allow you to get very specific data, well, some of the queries allow you to obtain more various data. And worry not for this session, tomorrow you will be uh, in the hand of Dr. Andresa Gomide from University of Coimbra, Portugal. Once you're on the Corpus system, Corpus query system I mentioned, how to query an assistant, 
in the interchange to concordance and frequency list. Or to put it simply, concordance is a list of keywords from the query, but presented with left and right context. This helps make meaningful interpretation as compared to observe words in isolation. Frequency list is a list of items, typically words with their corresponding frequencies. Concordance and frequency lists are two analytic features widely available in many corpus query systems as they are extremely useful in corpus data analysis or even in lexicography. We can create entries and obtain examples automatically. For this session, Dr. Peter Crosswhite from University of Queensland, Australia, Erwin on Corpus Language, who focus on data-driven learning, will be with you. In day four, we will learn about collocation, a concept of occurrence. You will learn how to define collocational strength of two words or more. For instance, bread is strongly associated with butter, and fish is strongly associated with chips. Yeah, well, maybe it can be different uh, in one culture to another. You will learn how to obtain such associative words automatically, as well as identifying their strength quantitatively. And for this session, you will be accompanied by Carolina Denistia, PhD, from UNS Indonesia. She graduated from University of Tübingen, Germany, and majoring in quantitative linguistics. The last day, day five, is dedicated to Dipanokura Special Lecture. The topic for Deep Scolding 2023 Deep Nagura Special Lecture is Lexical Complexity. You'll be introduced to a number of measures and how they can be used for a variety of courses, mainly for text profiling, such as measuring how difficult or how readable a text is, how diverse vocabulary is in a text, understanding author styles, etc. My colleague, Dr. Rafaela Bottini from Lancaster University, will deliver the lecture. Rafa specializes on lexical complexity, which makes her the very right person for this topic. Well, that will be all for the course structure, and I'm hoping that you will enjoy all the sessions on deep scolding. Over to you, moderators. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation of the course structure by Mr. Prihantoro, PhD. We will shortly begin our course session which will be brought to you by Dr. Robin Love, a lecturer of English language from Aston University, United Kingdom. Before we hand over this session to him, let us read his short CV. So we are we want to share a screen of his CV, please. Right, everyone, I assume that it is visible, right? So, Dr. Nobila works in the Department of English Languages and Applied Linguistics in the School of Social Sciences and Humanities, where he is the Director of Undergraduate English Program. Dr. Rabilov is also a researcher and educator in English language and linguistics, specializing in corpus linguistic, applied linguistic, and discourse analysis. He applies corpus method uh, to explore how English is used in the various contexts, including casual conversation, social media, and news reporting. He's a member of the Aston Center for Applied Linguistics. He is the co-director of the Aston Corpus Linguistic Research Group and the host of the Aston Originals Corpus Camp Podcast. If you want to know more about Dr. Lovila, please consult his CV or visit his website at lovilove.org. Note that we will distribute our online attendance list during the session via Zoom chat box. And now, for the session we all have been waiting for, let me hand you over to Dr. Lovila. For Dr. Lovila, you can start your session now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that lovely introduction and um, uh, quite a, a, a surprise to see my CV appear on the screen, but a wonderful way to, <laughs> I suppose, uh, make make it clear um, who I am and, and what I'm doing. I'm just going to uh, share my screen so that you can see my slides. Um, yes. OK. Hopefully that will be. Uh, working now is that working you can see my my screen my slides 
Yes, we can. Yes. Right. Okay. That's good. Okay. Let's just uh, put that there. And just checking before I begin as well, you can hear me clearly. The sound quality is is okay, is it? We hear you all right, Trubby. You can go ahead. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, yes, well, uh, hello everyone, and and thank you um, to Prehan Toro and and all of your your colleagues um, for uh, first of all for organizing this event. I think it's a it's a wonderful idea, and and of course most of all for uh, inviting me to to participate and and speak with you today. Um, it really is an honor to to be a part of uh, the the summer school, and 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 I hope that um, uh, for those of you who are new to Corpus Linguistics that you, you have a very um, interesting and, and enjoyable week um, learning a little bit about uh, this, this area of research. And I also hope that this is, um, you know, the first of many iterations of the uh, Dips Calling uh, Summer School and, and wish you all uh, a, a wonderful week of, of success in all the sessions. Um, as the, the first session of, of the summer school, um, it's a slightly daunting task to, to try to introduce um, something as, as vast and broadly applied as corpus linguistics. Um, and I'll do my best, uh, but, but I think I will say from the beginning that increasingly so, especially in the last uh, 20 years, um, corpus linguistics is increasingly appearing um, not only in, in so many areas of linguistics, but also so many areas beyond linguistics. And it is uh, a heavily um, applied set of tools that can be used for all sorts of purposes. So, of course, you know, in my session and, and throughout the week, it, it would not be possible to talk about every single possible way that corpus methods can be used, um, nor would it be possible to talk about every single corpus tool or corpus data set or um, methodology. But I hope today to, to start with, with a sort of broad introduction to the main ideas behind corpus linguistics um, and also give you a little bit of a, a flavor of, of what you have um, in store with, with my colleagues from universities uh, around the world that, that you just heard about who will be speaking to you uh, tomorrow uh, through to Friday. Um, so yes, just to give you a, an overview of, of my session, um, I will start by asking some of those big questions. You know, what, what is corpus linguistics essentially? And, and, and what do we mean when we talk about uh, a corpus? Um, and then we'll be thinking about the, the, the purpose of using corpus methods, of course, um, and, and as a, a set of methodologies used to conduct linguistic research, then clearly we are using corpus methods to ask and hopefully answer research questions. And so we'll talk about some of the sorts of questions that um, could be asked of corpus data uh, and some of the ways in which uh, academics in the field of corpus linguistics um, suggest that, that these questions should be, should be posed. Um, we'll also think about one uh, recent case study. Um, I, there are, you know, there are at this stage, countless publications in, in corpus linguistics and, and year on year this number increases in terms of journal articles and, and um, other uh, publications in the area. So to choose one out of uh, the field is, is not, of course, representative, but a recent um, paper by uh, Paul Baker at Lancaster University is as good as many um, possible demonstrations of some of the issues that I'll be discussing today. Um, and then I'll be talking about uh, corpus data and corpus tools. Again, there's an awful lot out there, but um, I know that the focus this week uh, in terms of demonstrating some of these approaches is the use of uh, CQP web, um, Lancaster's version of CQP web. And so I will um, introduce that tool um, and talk about a couple of the corpora that you can access there. Um, and you will uh, we won't get on to obviously, you know, looking at how to use that tool today, because that will be discussed uh, throughout the next uh, three sessions, at least um, in terms of the practical analytical methods. Today's session is a little bit more theoretical, and I think it's it's necessary for it to be so to, you know, really just kind of think about why, you know, why do we use these methods and, and what are the things that we can learn? Um, and then I'll try and sort of bring things together and point towards um, you know, where you'll be going next on the summer school, but also some other resources and, and, and things that you may find useful if you'd like to learn more 
um, about uh, corpus linguistics. Um, I don't really need this slide anymore because um, uh, Prihan Toro and his colleagues just did such an excellent job of introducing me. So I won't say um, much more about uh, my own background um, other than to, to say that, uh, you know, you, you've already heard um, Lancaster mentioned uh, a couple of times. And yes, I also have a connection to, to Lancaster uh, having studied there. Um, and uh, I think, you know, Lancaster among a few universities does pop up uh, quite regularly in conversations about corpus linguistics because it, it does have a, an incredibly rich uh, history of corpus linguistics and to this day has uh, a lot of researchers and, and teachers in corpus linguistics um, at that university. Um, however, uh, you know, the field has grown so much in recent decades that you now find corpus linguists all over the place um, in, you know, countless universities around the world. Um, and there are certainly in the UK, there are, you know, dozens at this stage of universities with groups of researchers of varying sizes um, doing corpus research, one of which is my my now my institution, my home institution, Aston University, which is in Birmingham. Um, and uh, the University of Birmingham, which is another of the universities in Birmingham, also has um, a rich history in corpus linguistics. Um, and there are several universities based in Birmingham in the UK that are, are starting to sort of work together to, to bring researchers together in, in that field. Um, and yes, you'll you'll hear about uh, my you know my sort of background in, in corpus linguistics as I as I sort of talk through today. Um, but aside from the the research that I do that uh, is largely based on British English, um, and and Priantora mentioned the the British National Corpus. Um, I'll be talking to you a little bit about that today as well. Um, my work has mostly been with uh, spoken corpus data, so transcripts of uh, recordings of people talking to each other. Um, transcripts of speech present their own issues from an analysis um, perspective uh, compared to uh, written corpus data. And so I'll try and sort of touch upon that distinction a little bit today as well. Um, and finally, before we begin, uh, I will say, and, and I'll probably plug this again later on, um, we're very excited in Aston to be launching an MA in English. Um, and not only are we teaching this, um, which includes teaching about corpus linguistics and, and related uh, uh, topics, not only are we teaching this as a face-to-face, -face, you know, uh, full-time master's program at Aston University, but we'll also be teaching it as a, uh, an online distance learning program, which is open to anyone from anywhere uh, in the world to, to uh, apply, and this is available Full time and also part time, and so we are launching this for the first time this September, and um, we're very excited to to welcome um, students uh, to our MA program to learn all sorts of things uh, in the world of English, including uh, corpus linguistics. Okay, so yes, <laughs> we'll begin now uh, with uh, an introduction to corpus linguistics, and I want to start by. Um, talking about an example of a specific text, okay? And so what we have here is an extract from uh, a newspaper article uh, from uh, a newspaper in the UK called The Daily Telegraph. And this is just an extract from uh, an opinion piece, okay? So this is a journalist essentially reviewing a television show. Um, again, the, the specific context is not so, not so uh, relevant. Um, but to demonstrate the sorts of things that we might look at from a, a language perspective, we have um, an article that is an opinion piece, so it is highly um, subjective and evaluative. And if we were to be looking at this text in isolation and conducting qualitative text analysis, uh, we, there's a lot of things that we could possibly do with this text to um, get a sense of the linguistic features that are being used, in order to inform our interpretation of, of the, 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 the function of the text and the arguments that are being put forward, okay? And so one of the things that you might do is look for adjectives, right? And so you might have this one text and you might look through it with a highlighter pen potentially, or you might be looking at it on your, 
your computer screen, and you might try and identify as many adjectives as you can, and you might end up looking at something like this, where you've found um, a bunch of adjectives, and you might then start to um, categorize these or otherwise comment on um, the sorts of uh, evaluations that are being expressed through these adjectives. And there are all sorts of linguistic frameworks and theories that can help you to, to interpret, in this case, uh, evaluative language, all right? Let's say you wanted to compare this to a different type of newspaper article. Um, here we have an extract from a hard news story. So it's still a news article, but in this case, it's a report about a very serious uh, crime. Um, it's talking about somebody being found guilty of a, a historical murder. So it's 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 very, very, um, very different. And it's very uh, serious. And it's reporting about a true event that has happened uh, in the world. Again, you might try uh, in comparing the two articles to look for adjectives. And again, you might go through and end up highlighting a bunch and starting to think about how these uh, these adjectives are used and, and the differences potentially in evaluative language. Obviously, there are other ways of uh, performing evaluation beyond adjectives, but this is just for the purposes of, of this demonstration. So what might you say in comparing those two? Obviously, I've only looked at a small sample, a small extract, but if you scaled this up and looked at the whole things, um, you know, you, you might sort of uh, conclude that there are relatively more adjectives in the uh, comment piece or the opinion piece. Um, in, in the extracts that I showed you, uh, 13, just over 13% of the words are adjectives. And in the serious news story, you might look and, and notice that there are relatively fewer adjectives, in this case, just under 9%, okay? And so that may as part of an analysis, uh, that in and of itself would, would not be enough, but just to demonstrate as part of an analysis, you may put together pieces of evidence like uh, how many adjectives there are and also you know, which adjectives and how they're being used and the functions they're performing. And eventually you might conclude something like the, uh, the opinion piece is more evaluative. It's uh, expressing more sub subjectivity, more opinions, et cetera. And the news report might be, uh, you may conclude that it's more informative um, and uh, you would look at this feature adjectives alongside lots of other features that are associated with uh, formality, informality, et cetera. Um, so why am I showing you these two examples? Well, this is an example of using the quantity of a linguistic feature, in this case, adjectives, as part of uh, a qualitative interpretation of the texts, okay? This sort of approach, um, you know, is, is the kind of thing that may be taught uh, as part of an undergraduate discourse analysis module where you're learning how to manually analyze um, written texts uh, as part of linguistic analysis. I certainly remember doing this sort of analysis as an undergraduate um, long before I, I learned more about corpus linguistics. The point being is that Thinking about how much something happens in language is already a part of linguistic analysis, regardless of the sort of uh, a particular framework or, or approach that you take. And I'm saying that at the beginning because corpus linguistics is often uh, framed as being highly, you know, quantitative uh, and, and requiring a high level of, of understanding of mathematical and statistical principles. And yes, of course, that is part of what corpus linguistics is. But uh, recently there have been lots of discussions about how corpus linguistics is potentially getting too far away from linguistics. Uh, and I agree that it's important that we should always remind ourselves, this is linguistics, right? First and foremost. The difference between other approaches that may involve more manual analysis compared to corpus linguistics um, is that corpus linguistics can scale up the kinds of analysis that you might be doing anyway on a text-to-text -text sort of manual basis, okay? And so in this case, we've made an observation about two texts, right? Uh, I can tell you uh, the conclusions I've made from those observations about those two individual texts, but I can't say anything about the genres that I'm looking at as a whole. I can't assume that this one opinion piece about one television show is in any way representative 
of the genre, because who knows, those features may be particular to the individual author. And there are all sorts of other variables that may explain why those features are there. If we wanted to actually look at, well, what about those types of articles on a broader kind of abstract level, we'd need to obviously look at more of these texts. We'd need to, to take a sample of these texts, probably quite a large sample of these texts, in order to uh, smooth out any possible variation that could be caused by other uh, variables that we're not interested in. And so corpus linguistics at its heart, and yes, it has you know, moved on in quite sophisticated ways, but the core principle behind corpus linguistics is scaling up the kind of analysis you might do anyway, so that you can look at large data sets of texts, so that you may be able to generalize your findings. That is the point, that is the main point of corpus linguistics. It's, it's linguistic analysis that is on a scale uh, large enough to be able to uh, generalize beyond the individual texts that you might be studying, okay? And so when we're thinking about a corpus, it is exactly that. It is your sample of texts. Um, and I think the context or, or the concept, I should say, of a corpus being a sample of text is a really important one to consider. There's lots of language happening all, all the time in many different modes and media, many different language varieties, many different contexts all around the world. And um, it's very rare that it's possible to gather every single piece of evidence of a particular context or, or discourse domain of language being used, unless that context is very, very narrowly restricted um, and you're able to gather all the evidence. Most uh, corpus studies involve not looking at every single piece of evidence of that language being used, but rather a sample of something bigger, okay? And so if you're taking a sample and if your plan is to generalize your findings uh, because of the observations you've made of that sample, then you have to be confident that, that that sample actually represents the broader domain of language usage that you're interested in, okay? And so there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of literature out there with researchers in the field talking about different ways that we can define a corpus with respect to those concepts. Um, corpus itself, the word does come from Latin. It comes from the, the Latin word for body. Um, and I'd certainly heard of the English word corpse long before I'd heard of corpus as in corpus linguistics. Uh, and often because of this association with the Latin word for body, a, 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 a more common than you'd think misconception uh, from those who've not heard of corpus linguistics before is that they think it's the study of body language. Um, and that is a reasonable uh, misconception to make because of, of what the Latin word means. Um, this is not body as in the human body. Uh, it's a metaphorical body, uh, a body of texts, okay? A sample of texts, a set of texts that are gonna be studied uh, for the purposes of linguistic analysis. So there are lots of discussions out there. I've just picked out a few um, short quotes from some of the many relevant uh, books and articles that have been published in this area. And you can see that they're all saying something broadly similar in terms of um, a set of uh, texts that are studied using computer software. Um, and in some way they are, are purposefully designed to be, um, to be studied from a linguistic perspective. Um, and so some of the, the principles that are usually associated with corpora, um, not universally, but certainly these are concepts that come up commonly enough, um, is that the language that is being sampled is, uh, as, as it's known, authentic. And the concept of authenticity in corpus linguistics is a very interesting one. There's lots of discussion about this um, because it, it draws a distinction between, uh, I suppose, more traditional um, uh, approaches to linguistics, which involve uh, an expert uh, speaker, so to speak, just sort of thinking to themselves uh, about their own intuitions about language. Um, and research has shown that, that humans in general are not very good um, at generalizing from their own intuitions, and often their experiences are not necessarily shared by the broader population of uh, speakers and writers. Um, and we're interested in also the distinction between going out there into the world and observing how people use language to do 
their business, whatever the context is. It's about taking data that would have taken uh, samples from linguistic communication that would have happened anyway. And we so happen to be taking a sample of that and studying it as distinguished from uh, in experimental or elicitated data where you might um, recruit participants and invite them to your university and sit them in a room and interview them or ask them questions or ask them to pronounce certain words. And you're creating language data that would not have occurred um, if you weren't doing your research study. Most research in corpus linguistics is about taking samples of language that has already happened anyway, or would have already happened anyway. Um, there are some exceptions to that, um, but in general, it's about how do people use language to achieve their communicative functions or purposes or goals. I've mentioned the idea of uh, representativeness as well. Um, it's, it's an important one, but, but sometimes very, very difficult to achieve. Um, some communicative contexts are much easier to uh, ensure representativeness when gathering a sample than others. There are lots of practical uh, issues that can um, make uh, assessing the representativeness of a sample difficult. Um, and we'll we'll see some examples today, and, and I'm sure you'll see other examples throughout the week where um, the question of how good is this sample will certainly come into it when you're looking at data and making observations. The other principle that is um, often observed, although uh, I'd say there's there's more variation uh, in, in some ways these days, is that the corpus is large. And large, in fact, all of these terms, including large, um, are relative to several things, including the, um, the particular context of the study and also the research questions. Um, what do I mean by this? Well, as I said, corpus linguistics emerged out of um, uh, a desire to scale up uh, the scope of linguistic analysis to achieve things beyond what an individual human could do manually. OK, um, and so in that sense, uh, a, you know, a, a defining feature of corpus linguistics is that it allows you to study samples of language that are larger than you would have been able to otherwise. Um, you know, to to support the endeavor of generalizing your findings beyond the the data that you've that you've got, and so in that sense, yes, size is is a huge part of it, and we often you know encounter these days corpora that are you know unbelievably large and and almost to the point of be, not really being able to really conceive of the size of the data set, billions or even trillions of words worth of text. Um, and certainly, you know, there are lots of uh, uh, big tech companies around the world who have huge, huge, huge data sets of language that they use to inform their products. Um, if you think about, you know, uh, these uh, home assistant AI uh, uh, machines like Alexa, for example, which is produced by Amazon, um, you know, every time that somebody says, hello to that tool and asks them to, I don't know, turn on the lights or, um, or you know, remind them to take the washing out later or whatever it is, um, they're recording everything you say to it all the time and, and, and they are adding it into their data set to improve what the tool can do uh, in terms of processing what, what you call natural language uh, data. Um, and so, you know, Chat GPT and, and AI chatbots as well, for example. Again, these tools like Chat GPT, which has been out for a few months now, they will be retaining every single thing that users say to it to ask it for help with something or to prompt it to provide them with information and forever increasing the size of their linguistic data set in order to um, improve the predictive function of these tools, right? And so you have really huge data sets of, of, of language data. But nowadays, I would, you know, you, you do see corpus research that actually uses uh, data that you might consider to be quite small, right? Um, there have been, you know, perfectly well, you know, principled uh, corpus studies uh, of data sets, only a few thousand words in length, uh, data that um, you, you could have reasonably analyzed manually otherwise. Um, and so there isn't really a kind of any more, I, I would not argue that there's kind of a lower bound 
at which you say there's no point in 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 using corpus methods at all you know it, dep it depends on what you want to do so you see corpora my point is really that you see corpora of lots of different sizes now um and you know the size that will be appropriate to helping you to answer your research question will of course depend on what your research question is so uh, you know we've looked at sort of what a corpus is and and obviously this week you will be getting hands on experience with with searching for a corp searching through corpus data and and getting a sense of what that looks like and you'll see a little bit of that in today's session as well um what are the sort of how do we sort of more broadly kind of zoom out and think about corpus linguistics as a field um i i recognize that by answering the question of what is corpus linguistics by saying immediately a set of methods uh, that is already a potentially controversial statement um just because there are um there are those in the field who who you know would foreground the theoretical contribution that corpus linguistics has made uh, over the decades which it has uh, lots of theories of language have emerged from um corpus uh, research but nowadays i would say that more of a majority of researchers as the uh, as corpus linguistics becomes um, increasingly applied, as, uh, especially to other disciplines that um, are not related or, or not part of uh, linguistics, it's it's much more uh, pragmatic, I think, to consider corpus linguistics more purely as a set of methods, a set of methods based from the study of language that can be applied to uh, language data. Um, and it's quite a practical way of thinking about things, and I think a, a, a sensible way of introducing corpus linguistics to uh, researchers and students who are not so familiar with it already. Um, and so really, to summarize what I've said so far, um, I would say that, you know, it's it's the principle, the, the, the main principle behind it, as I said, is to allow you to do things that you can already do on a bigger scale. There is more to it than that, and certainly it, it unlocks the ability to do other things that you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise, particularly when it comes to statistical analyses. Um, but at its at its heart, you know, it's about scaling up uh, linguistic analysis to a bigger data set. Um, and for me, and I think many people in in research in this area, the 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 main point of doing that, the main reason, is that it helps you to notice things, patterns in language that um, you may not notice when you're only looking at one or two texts individually, okay? Um, and when you suddenly have hundreds or thousands of texts, you're able to uh, look at what they have in common uh, across the text, which features are distributed across those texts, which features are specific or, or less common, how are these, uh, how's the distribution of these features changing over time, for example, but you may notice things about language that you probably wouldn't notice when you're just looking at one or two texts. A metaphor that I like to use when I think about corpus linguistics is uh, the difference between, you know, let's say if you're standing in the middle of a city and you don't have your phone with you, you don't have a map, all you can see are the buildings immediately in front of you and the, the roads and the trees or whatever. Um, but you 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 might struggle to find your way to another part of that city um, without the use of a, a map or anything. Suddenly, if you have your phone with you or you have a, an old fashioned paper map, you can actually get it. You get a, literally a bird's eye view of the entire city and you can see how the buildings are connected by the roads. You can see the, the connections between them. You can work out how to get from one place to the next and you can get a much, much better perspective of the overall um, landscape of how things are working in that city compared to just your own perspective as an individual person on the ground looking around you. Um, and, you know, the map metaphor is, is helpful. It's not helpful in every way, but it's quite helpful also because a map is by definition an abstraction. Yeah, a, a map does not visually represent every single detail or every particular feature. Um, there are different kinds of maps that will show you different levels of detail and highlight certain things. In some ways, a corpus uh, is, is similar, 
um, in that, you know, you can abstract away and look at the overall general patterns in, in the data. And so we're also thinking about, um, you know, testing intuitions about language use. You as an individual may feel that uh, you've noticed something in a particular discourse domain and you want to see whether your intuition is proven true or not. Um, and of course, as I've said, the principle here really is about making generalizations based on the data that you're looking at. Um, there's a quote here from from Hunston. It's quite a long one, but I, but I think you know the the main point here is is to try and put things together and um, think about how uh, there are so many different types of corpora. Um, and so uh, Hunston uh, says that it involves collecting, she says the word large, large quantities of naturally occurring language using software that manipulates that language to obtain information about frequencies, co-occurrences, and meanings. You'll be learning about frequencies, co-occurrences, and meanings in other sessions this week. Um, and I would agree with Hunston that those are, you know, at the heart of, of, of most corpus analyses. Uh, she goes on to say that the language may be spoken, written, or signed um, in one language variety or more, uh, and one register or more. It consists of language which has occurred in natural contexts, not as a result of elicitation or introspection. Um, and so you can, you can, you know, it summarizes really what I've been saying and that it's about going out there in the world, so to speak, and, and observing how people use language. Uh, and that corpora do vary uh, an awful lot, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in terms of size. The final point she makes is that the corpus usually contains, usually contains uh, more text than could reasonably be read and remembered by an individual. And that is exactly the, the, the main principle behind it in, in the whole. Um, and uh, others have, have sort of highlighted that the aspect of uh, the, the main point being about generalization. And so uh, Egbert et al. say that uh, the ultimate goal is a generalizable empirical description of language uh, in a target discourse domain. And the corpus itself, uh, the, the role of it is to represent that target is a domain of language use. Um, and they also discuss something quite interesting, and I wanted to touch upon this as well. Um, if you're familiar with, with linguistics more generally, then you, you'll be familiar with the names that we have for subdisciplines, right? And so, for example, sociolinguistics is uh, the linguistic study of, of language use in social contexts and, and how language varies according to uh, social uh, variation. Um, you know, cognitive linguistics is the study of language uh, and cognition, language in the brain. Um, corpus linguistics is, you know, not quite the same, actually, because the corpus part is not really talking about the specific domain of language or, or aspect of language, um, but rather the method that is used to analyze language. You know, um, sociolinguistics is, as I said, the study of language sort of um, in society and the variation, it doesn't really tell you about the method, but corpus linguistics is not the study of corpus, so to speak, but rather the use of corpus methods to study language. So the, there can be um, slightly, uh, it can be slightly um, tricky to kind of align that because it does stand out as being very different uh, in its naming convention compared to many other subdisciplines of linguistics. Um, and Egbert and et al. do sort of discuss that issue. Um, they say the goals of corpus linguistics are much more methodological to construct and empirically analyze a sample of texts, the corpus, as the basis for meaningful generalizations about a language or discourse domain. Um, OK, so the final part of this first section um, is to uh, sort of think about the, the assumptions that I guess I and, and other corpus researchers sort of make about the, the set of conditions that, that are usually true when embarking on, on corpus research. Um, and so McHenry and Bretzina talk about um, how, you know, we, we need to think of, of corpus linguistics as a science, okay? Um, and if we are thinking of corpus linguistics as a science, uh, analogous to uh, hard science uh, disciplines, then we have to kind of think about the equivalences between corpus linguistics and the approaches that are taken in this field and other scientific disciplines. Um, 
And so they talk about having, you know, the equipment to collect data, the means to analyze data, the infrastructure that the researcher needs to do the research uh, and training. And those are the sort of main areas. So they talk about, in terms of corpus linguistics, um, the distinction between uh, using a corpus that already exists and has been made publicly available. Uh, and there are many, and we'll talk about some examples of those today. And I'm sure you'll be exploring some uh, in the other sessions this week too. So you, you might select uh, an off-the-shelf or pre-prepared reference corpus, um, or you might build your own corpus and um, gather texts uh, from the particular context that you're interested in to, um, to analyze yourself. And I'll show you examples of tools, corpus tools, that um, allow for both of these options, right? Corpus tools that provide access to uh, pre-prepared uh, off-the-shelf corpora, but also allow you to upload your own corpus data in the case that you've gathered your own texts. Um, so the means to collect the data. Then you need, of course, uh, the equipment or, or um, the, the uh, appropriate uh, facility to analyze the data. In corpus linguistics, this, uh, as I said, uh, is a digital approach to language. It's la uh, linguistic analysis done using uh, computer programs. Um, I would say that most researchers in corpus linguistics, um, especially as the field grows, use pre-existing uh, software packages that have been programmed by other researchers and released um, either for free or, or, or for payment. Um, and um, there are, however, uh, you know, a, a sizable number of uh, researchers in corpus linguistics who program their own uh, software directly. So they know how to code in, in certain uh, languages, uh, for example, Python, which is a common language used uh, in corpus, uh, corpus uh, tools or corpus programming, and they do it themselves. Um, I am one of the many, I, I'm, I would say, I, I'm going to be confident in saying majority. I, I might be wrong there, but I, I still sense that um, it's maybe going down, but I would still say overall, a majority of corpus linguists are not programming their own stuff themselves, but rather using tools that other people have programmed. I'm one of those people. So I don't, I don't know how to program or code myself. I don't produce, I don't create my own software. Um, I rely entirely on software that other researchers have made for people like me to use, for which I'm very grateful, of course. Um, so in my case, and in the case of a lot of people who are new to corpus linguistics, again, the, the, the task is to use a tool that someone else has made for you. Um, importantly, they, they highlight that it needs to be possible for you to discuss your work with others. And there are lots of different ways of engaging in discussion with other researchers in corpus linguistics. This summer school being one very, very good example of facilitating uh, a discussion um, and the sharing of ideas between uh, researchers. Obviously, um, publicating, uh, publicating, publishing, goodness me, publications, I was going to say, and then change my mind to so publishing. Publishing research is, of course, another way of having, I suppose, an asynchronous, but nonetheless, a discussion, um, both in terms of the review process, you're getting uh, uh, other researchers to read your work and, and give you feedback. And then, of course, when you publish your research, other people will read it and maybe do uh, work that is inspired or, or, or questions what you've done. And then, of course, there are um, lots of informal opportunities for researchers to engage with each other, for example, on social media, right? Uh, Twitter, although is, um, I suppose, dying at the moment, uh, thanks to Elon Musk, uh, Twitter is still the most um, you know, active online community for uh, researchers in, in probably most, if not all, academic disciplines, certainly corpus linguistics as well. Um, that may, as I said, be changing soon, but there's an awful lot of corpus linguists who are using Twitter actively, and that is a great way to facilitate the exchange of ideas. There are lots of different ways that, that, it, that it is possible for uh, corpus researchers to discuss their work with others, and it's, it's crucial as part of the research process. Um, and finally, of course, is training, right? Um, I did not uh, wake up one morning uh, a corpus linguist uh, or a researcher of any kind. It took years of training, you know, going to university, attending uh, conferences, attending courses and summer schools like this one. Um, 
And, and that is, I think, ever more important as more researchers from other disciplinary backgrounds start to kind of dip in and become interested by what corpus linguistics could do for them. Um, you increasingly have people who are not actually linguists engaging with corpus methods. And so I think training, not only in the practical aspects of how to use, uh, how to collect data, how to use a particular software uh, program, but the theoretical principles that underpin the, the research process is really, really important. And that's why, you know, as I said, today's session is not so practical because I think it's it's really important to think quite a lot about the, the point behind what we're doing here and why we're doing it. Uh, so as to help you become aware of the potential limitations of this sort of research, of which there are potentially many um, that need to be taken into account when interpreting what we find in the data and importantly when reporting to others uh, what we find in the data, whether that's in an undergraduate essay, a master's dissertation, a PhD thesis, or publishing uh, in academic journals and, and book series, etc. Okay, I'm going to pause for like three seconds, I have a sip of coffee. Um, and I'll take this opportunity, now that I'm about to move on to the next section of today's session, um, if anybody does have a question that they'd like to ask right now so far, based on what I've already talked about, this is uh, an opportunity to do so. So if anyone would like to um, come in and say hello and introduce themselves and, and respond to what I've said so far, you're very welcome to do so now while I um, sip on my coffee. <laughs> Hello, I. Oh yes, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Yes. I'm afraid I'm I'm struggling to um to hear you. It's it sounds not not so. Good. Um. If anyone yes. has any problem. In, in the microphone. So perhaps you can type your questions on the chat box. I think that will do, Ravi, right? So yeah, we seem yeah, to yes. have one, yeah. one question in the chat box from Maria Amari. Oh, great, sorry. I, I Yes, yeah, sorry, I couldn't see the chat box there, but I can see it now, thank you. Um, right, yes. Okay, yes, Maria. So is corpus linguistics a method or uh, an approach? Um, well, in, 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 in some ways, those terms are quite similar, and you do see them used uh, almost interchangeably. Um, you hear, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, publications that talk about, you know, corpus approaches to uh, whatever particular uh, context they're interested in. Um, so I would say those, those terms are, are, are similar. I suppose um, corpus linguistics is an, an approach or a set of approaches to the study of uh, to the study of language. Maybe when we use the term methods, we're talking a bit more specifically about the practicalities of how that happens. So maybe an approach is more of a general term, but they're they're more or less the same. And I wouldn't say that that they are. I it's either a method or an approach. I'd say it's both. You know, methods and approaches. They're they're kind of near synonyms in in some way. Uh, oh, th thank you, uh, thank you, Sidra, for your comment. Apologies that I, I couldn't I couldn't hear you very clearly there, but um, thank you. Okay, hello, one more uh, and, then, doctor, and then we'll carry on. Yes, doctor, uh, doc, hello, Doctor Robbie. Hello, am I audible? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Yes. Okay, uh, th that's good. Um, um, doctor Robbie, uh, since English language has been the universal language, the global language, and the most researchable language. Also, do you think that uh, the, the concept of corpus linguistics, can they be applied on other indigenized languages, especially, I mean, as this conference is being relayed from Indonesia, and I'm here sitting in, in, in Pakistan, right, where we have so many actually local languages. So do you think that the concept of uh, corpus linguistic uh, can uh, be practically applied uh, as per the claimed methodologies in the field. Yes, uh, absolutely. I, I mean, it already it already is to an extent. Uh, there are ever increasing corpus compilation projects capturing more and more uh, languages and language varieties around the world. Um, you're right that you know the the development of the field of corpus linguistics largely took place 
um, you know, in in Western uh, Anglis, uh, Anglophone uh, countries like the United Kingdom, the United States to a uh, to a lesser extent because they kind of went off it for a few decades when Noam Chomsky was uh, was quite big. Um, but certainly, you know, the the United States, it's it's there's a lot of corpus research going on again there now. Uh, and yes, I mean, English is. Um, uh, you know, certainly the most studied language uh, from in, in corpus linguistics, um, but that isn't to say that that I mean th these approaches are I would say theoretically possible with with every every language. Um, obviously, there are some languages that might uh, make it harder to do some of this kind of work because it's based on uh, being able to chop up words into discrete units, uh, and some languages um, you know are structured in a way where those boundaries are maybe slightly harder to to detect um compared to uh languages like english but um yes i mean there are there are there are lots of uh corpora of um all sorts of language varieties but it yes it, it's it's obviously the case that there is a a dominance of of english i i am i guess um contributing to that problem because that that is the area in which i work um and it's in a way a kind of self-fulfilling cycle because you know at Lancaster where I studied um they have a history of doing corpus linguistics with other languages but mostly with English uh and then they wanted you know the next generation to continue doing that and so they kind of continue to to feed that cycle in a way um but I I think absolutely you know it, it, it it's not although a lot of the research and a lot of the examples that people will give will be uh, related to uh, historical studies in English, um, that's more of an artifact of the development of the field and, and not a reflection on the limits of what corpus linguistics can do. Um, but some languages, of course, you know, you might not be able to kind of directly apply kind of the template of how things are done with English to every language just because of the, ver the variation in the, the ways that languages are sort of structured, typologically speaking, around the world. But yes, corpus linguistics can be and is applied to, to lots of uh, languages. And actually a lot of the tools, not all, some of them only work in some languages, but a lot of the tools are, are what you might call language agnostic in, in that they, at least in principle, will, will allow you to use the methods that are available in those tools with, um, with whichever language uh, data that you've, that you've gathered. But there is absolutely an, uh, an imbalance and there's also, you know, imbalances that, that we have to kind of acknowledge are associated with broader historical and contemporary issues with funding and the um the the dominance of of english and uh you know colonial histories i mean it's don't want to get all political but it is all part of why you know certain things get a lot more attention than others and certain institutions and countries get more funding than others it's 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 all part of it um so, but yes, I mean, what's great is that you do see more and more corpus compilation projects that um, that that gather samples from an increasing diversity of languages, and I think that's only only to be considered as a good thing. Um, hope that answered your question. I, I I feel I've almost made a mistake here in opening up the Q and A partway through. I just wanted a sip of coffee, but now there's loads of questions in the chat. I might not answer them all now um because i want to move on but I'll, I'll i'll maybe take one more now and then we'll i'll i'll spend the, the time we have at the end to kind of cover more because some of these questions um i'll be answering anyway but i will take um one more um yes priya asks uh if a corpus has to be of naturally occurring language what about childs and talk bank well okay good question um This is why the issue of authenticity is kind of a little bit uh it's 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 contentious because um naturally occurring uh, as a as a term similar to authentic is um that can be interpreted in different ways right so you know if i were to go on youtube and transcribe a bunch of youtube videos from um i don't know news broadcasts from the tv then um then is it natural that somebody has pre-prepared their, their, what they're going to say and it's it's on a screen on an autocue and they're reading it out to an audience and there's only one person and there's no one interrupting and responding back because it's a monologue, 
X, Y, Z. Is that natural? Well, maybe it's not natural in this in the sense that having a chat with your friend might come more naturally, but it is authentic in the sense that this is a, a real situation, if you will, that would have occurred anyway. And it's a real discourse context, right, of, of, of an authentic situation. Um, but yeah, in terms of spoken corpora, um, you know, I, I'll be talking in a moment about the, the British national corpora and the spoken components. And, and this all this already kind of breaks, if it is a rule, it's I wouldn't say it's a rule, it's maybe a principle about authenticity. You know, we had to get consent from participants. It's unethical and often uh, illegal in many countries to um, record somebody, uh, you know, as a university, to record somebody without their consent and use their data for research without their consent. Um, and so, you know, you're asking participants to use their phone to audio record the using the voice memo function on their phone. Um, and, you know, OK, press record on your phone and put it on the table and now just have a totally normal and natural conversation with your mum or your husband or your friend or your you know classmate or whoever it is. It's like, you know, ignore the forget you're being recorded and just have the conversation that you would have had anyway. Obviously, you know, it there is interference. There is an element of the observer's paradox there um, that in that case cannot be avoided in terms of the legal and ethical principles that universities are uh, in many in many places are bound by. So it's authentic. Like all of these principles, actually, they're relative, but they're also on a bit of a scale. Uh, I think it's not that. Uh, a corpus text is either authentic or not authentic. It could be authentic to an extent. And I think that is part of the way that we interpret our findings and and maybe mitigate, you know, the findings if, if necessary. Um, but yes, that's a good question. I will move on. There's lots of really interesting questions. Feel free to keep keep them coming in the chat as and when you think of them. And then I'll try and get through as many as I can in the time at the end. OK, right. Good. OK, we're going to move on now and think about research questions. Um, I wanted to start by by sort of, again, highlighting really that corpus linguistics is, is applied or can be applied in so many areas. And so um, when uh, Prehan Torre asked me to talk about, you know, research questions in corpus linguistics, it was like, well, my goodness, there's so many different ways of asking questions of the data. So I wanted to start by, I guess, thinking more about how certain areas of inquiry uh, are associated with certain kind of disciplinary uh, applications, okay? And so just to sort of give you a few examples, corpus linguistics really emerged, um, or, or early research in corpus linguistics was, was applied really in, in one major context, which was lexicography. Uh, which is the the production and, and maintenance of dictionaries. So, you know, trying to look at what a word means and how it's used and how the meaning is changing over time. And so corpus linguistics, probably one of the earliest applications was in this industry, was in uh, the lexicography industry. And so really, you know, those sorts of questions, the basic questions, if you will, about how is this word used? How frequent is it compared to other words? How does it vary? across different genres uh, over time, um, you know, how does the frequency of a word go up and down, et cetera. Those kind of big, you know, questions that are, are you know, fairly quantitative in nature can be talked about in terms of lexicography, but also they do feature as part of um, a lot of other, <laughs> a lot of other uh, research projects in corpus linguistics. Um, related to that, of course, we can think about language variation and change, sociolinguistics, comparing different types of corpora to each other and, um, and you know, noting the, the similarities and differences and interpreting them in terms of those variables. Discourse analysis is, uh, a, a, you know, an area of, of great uh, uh, application in terms of corpus linguistics. Really, there's an entire subdiscipline of corpus linguistics now uh, known variously, but I know it as CADS, Corpus Assisted Discourse Studies, that is about applying corpus methods, particularly to, you know, how is, uh, what is, what are the, the arguments that are being made by an author? What are the uh, implicit 
meanings, what are the um, potentially the, the biases in the texts, etc. And there's there's all sorts of really interesting things there. A few others here. Um, again, these are just a few examples. There are so many different ways of asking questions of, of corpus data, but we can think about pragmatics. Um, you know, what is what is there in the sort of actual explicitly in the text? What is what meanings are implied but are not encoded explicitly? Obviously, language learning and language acquisition and language teaching. Um, another huge area of application of corpus linguistics and has been for, again, it's, it was along with lexicography, you know, language teaching um, is another quite early area of application of corpus linguistics and has decades of research behind it already. Um, and, and that has sort of sort of spread out into, I guess, related areas, thinking more about the theories of language acquisition, translation studies. Um, and and other and other contexts and and how data can be used to how corpus data can be used to help directly with with teaching in the classroom uh, in an approach known as data driven learning. Uh, one of the speakers, uh, one of the other speakers this week, uh, Dr. Peter Crossway, is um, is an expert in in researching in, in data driven learning, and I imagine he'll probably mention it at some point because it's one of his main areas of interest. Um, and so I'll I'll allow him. To, to talk about it more. If he doesn't mention it in his talk, then feel free to ask him because I, 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 I'm I pretty sure it's one of the things he's happiest to talk about uh, in the whole world. Um, he's, he's very much involved with that sort of work. Um, and then obviously the stuff I was mentioning earlier about, you know, big kind of tech firms and, and um, companies, you know, using uh, language data to build their uh, models, if you will, their algorithms, their neural networks, whatever term that you use. Not so, not a world that I'm really involved with, but certainly a very, very um, interesting one. These are just a few, and really, I'm I'm sort of showing you this because there are lots of questions here, and there are lots of questions that we can ask of corpus data. Um, but I will narrow down now and think about you know something a bit more specific. And we're going to work really the remainder of today's session. We're going to build towards creating our own research question about a particular. Um, type of data. Um, and it's for the purposes of this session, it's going to be quite a, a, a small, you know, a narrowly defined question, something that that doesn't require uh, very much analysis to be able to answer one way or the other. But it's a way of quickly kind of demonstrating some of the principles behind how do we build a research question uh, in corpus uh, research? Um, and how do we, you know, how do we, I suppose, make decisions uh, uh, related to the research question about the method, including the choice of the corpus and the methods that we will use to analyze the corpus. Okay, so what questions can we answer with corpus linguistics? I've already kind of suggested that there aren't many that we can't, um, and that is true, you know, but there are certain patterns in the kinds of questions that people um, ask. And, and the main thing here is, is that um, having a research question kind of well articulated before you begin doing your analysis is really important. And, and actually, you know, a thing that some sometimes researchers kind of forget, and, and, I'll, and, 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 you know, I occasionally am guilty of this too. And there's a very good reason for this, which I'll explain in a little bit. But um, the, the principle is a good one, which is that you kind of have to know what you want to find out, right, before you begin the research. Um, and again, this comes from comparing corpus linguistic research to uh, other scientific disciplines that are, are probably a lot more formally kind of structured in terms of the research process. And I think <clears throat> corpus linguistics is in a way kind of trying to play catch up a little bit. Sorry, I have to keep sipping my coffee. I'm six hours behind you, so it's it's only approaching half ten in the morning and I'm still waking up a little bit because... I, yeah, I struggle to get out of bed really early. Uh, um, yes, so so McHenry and Brizzino, a recent uh, book uh, on the fundamental principles of corpus linguistics. Um, if you are interested really in the meaty kind of theoretical stuff behind the assumptions that corpus linguistics makes as a research, um, <laughs> as a discipline, then it's a, it's a very, it's quite a, a heavy book in that sense. It's not very practical, very theoretical. But they do, you know, discuss some really interesting things and they talk about research questions. So they say that either when building a corpus or when using one, 
corpus linguists should use research questions in order to engage with their data in a structured and controlled way. Um, and they also give some suggestions about the broad kinds of questions or, or things that we might be interested in asking of the data. And <clears throat> the main point they make is that the vast majority of corpus studies are observational. So this is the point I made um, earlier about uh, we're, we're gathering data that um, that has, you know, from contexts that have already, you know, occurred authentically, and we are observing, describing, and interpreting the uh, the data that we um, the findings that we make on the corpus data. <laughs> Apologies, I just need to take a sip of water, I think. Sorry for that, Robbie. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's okay. Oh, it's I was joking <laughs> about that. The, <laughs> I was broking about the, the joke about the time difference. It, it's it's a very reasonable hour of the morning. Um, it's just me. I'm quite lazy sometimes. It's it's fine. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, yeah, so they they um they they talk about how you know we are we are trying to um we are trying to observe the sorts of language usage that that is that is occurring out there in whatever particular context um and hunston also suggests a few kinds of questions out of many that we might ask i think here she's talking kind of more specifically about discourse analysis but <laughs> but the point is is broadly true it's obviously a lot related to frequency at least to begin with how often is something discussed? You know, what is the frequency of a particular word um, compared to others? Frequency change over time, the relationship between words in terms of their frequency, how are text structured, what attitudes are expressed, all sorts of things. Um, the point being, though, that that there must be, you know, some kind of research question expressed. Um, otherwise, you know, because all of the really many of the methodological decisions and analytical decisions you make um, when conducting corpus research has to be informed by the research question or questions that you're asking. So, um, you know, how might we sort of begin to consider what it means to come up with a, a good research question? Uh, and, you know, this is subjective to an extent, but there, there are researchers who have, you know, Put, put forward certain principles or, 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 or descriptions of how this tends to happen. Um, and I think this is actually a good starting point, again, from Susan Hunston, who uh, I should say is a, um, an eminent uh, professor in, in corpus linguistics at the University of Birmingham um, and has published lots of uh, highly influential uh, research in the field. Um, this particular, I've got a list of references at the end and you have access to the slides, so, you know, You'll, you'll see where where to where to access this stuff if you would like to read more. This particular book is the second edition of her. It was originally published in two thousand and two, Corporate and Applied Linguistics, and that was a highly um, highly cited and 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 influential uh, book in terms of how corpus methods are, are being applied. So this is the the second edition. A distinction she makes, I think, is is a really nice way of framing it that I haven't seen before expressed in this way. But to think about corpus linguistics broadly as being either inward facing or outward facing. And so inward facing is essentially kind of within linguistics, you know, how is the language, you know, what is what is the language like, as, as uh, Hunson uh, frames it? You know, we can describe the grammatical features, we can compare languages or language varieties to each other. This is more of your sort of disciplinary linguistics research for the sake of learning more about language and how it works, right? And then you have the outward facing research, which is really the, the functional stuff, the applied stuff, which is we're not here to better describe how language works in terms of its features um, and how it's changing over time, but rather how is language being used in a particular context to achieve communicative goals uh, whatever they are. And so in a way, th this distinction between inward facing and outward facing could be uh, in parallel with the distinction between linguistics and applied linguistics as well. Um, and I think that's quite a nice way of, of looking at it, because actually, you know, there is a big difference between uh, the sort of study where 
and and this is what I'll be doing. The, the example I'll be giving you is is I would certainly call an inward facing research question about how is you know British English changing over time, and the the questions you're asking and the and the discussion is all just about describing how the language works, right? How it's how it's used, uh, oh, sorry, how it's structured, right? Um, it's not asking about you know how are people using British English in a particular context to achieve a certain goal or how could we improve how language is used etc to to you know improve something so um it's a good way to uh distinguish from the beginning the kind of questions we might ask um Stefanovic uh puts forward um uh I guess a, a sort of set of uh, a list if you will of steps of designing um uh, a corpus research question um, and this also introduces us a distinction between uh, deductive uh, reasoning and inductive reasoning. Um, I'll talk about induction a little bit later, but uh, deduction is, is what we'll be thinking about first. Um, and uh, this is when you, you, you basically have, uh, you've observed something, you know, in one particular context, and you've developed a hypothesis and you want to test that hypothesis against uh, a, a large sample of data to see whether that hypothesis can be verified or generalized um, or, or not, or falsified. Um, and so uh, the principles that, that Stefanovic discusses are choosing the object of research. Um, this is a little bit vague, I suppose, conceptually, because the object could be um, not necessarily the specific corpus, but rather the broader domain. Um, and it also will involve the theoretical constructs that are that are relevant. Um, you'll see an example of this, which will help to, to demonstrate this in a bit. But once you've kind of decided in general terms, you know, what is the, the language, for example, that I'm interested in? And within that language, you know, what is the particular context? Uh, the the domain the the genre the mode etc and what is the general sort of um maybe the theoretical uh principle that we're that is relevant you know testing a testing a hypothesis about a certain theory you so you've you know you've got your observation of something you've 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 got a hunch you've got a you've got a, a hypothesis that's developing in your mind then you need to obviously state the research question uh, and you do this bit before you you design your study because you need to know what question you're asking before you make decisions about the the, the specific data set and the specific things you're going to be searching for in the data set. And so <clears throat> um, we can think about terms that are borrowed from from other disciplines like statistics. We have the dependent variable, which is the thing that we're investigating essentially. Um, you know, the thing that you have. Uh, a hunch or or, an, uh, or a hypothesis about, um, and that might be that could be a, a, a general trend that you're noticing. It might refer it might refer to a specific word or phrase. It might be something about a particular uh, group of speakers, you know, a social issue. But that's the kind of the 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 thing that you're interested in in investigating, and you're investigating the relationship between how that thing occurs and variables that might influence that or distinguish it. And so on the other side, you have the independent variables. Um, and these are the things that we think might provide the explanation um, for that, uh, that thing happening. So it might be an external factor like gender. So you might have a, a hunch that, you know, women, um, use uh intensified language or you know for example more than men and so your dependent variable is you know intensifying uh words that can contribute to intensifying um and your independent variable well one of them will be the gender you know comparing men and women um and other ones might be specific words that you know, do perform intensification, and they might distribute differently too, right? So you're 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 essentially trying to, you know, test hypotheses around the relationships between different variables, and the one you're focusing on is the dependent one, and any others that may uh, explain how that variable is used are the independent ones. 
From this, you derive a hypothesis. Stefanovic uses the term testable, which is a good term to use because that's what you'll be doing. You'll be, you know, I think that this is the case. Okay, let's find out whether it is or not, right? But note that I just said whether it is or not. Um, a hypothesis is only can is only a, a valid one if the design of your study allows for that hypothesis to be what's known as falsified, right? And again, McKenna and Brezina talk a lot about these principles, including falsification. Um, it has to be possible as part of your study that your hypothesis could be proven false. Um, so if the data will uh, would not allow you potentially to uh, have your hypothesis rejected, then it's not a good study design. So you need to kind of basically the point is when you're starting your research, looking at the data, you need to know what would I be observing if my if my hypothesis were true. What would be the things that I would be noticing um, if if what I think is correct? But crucially, what would what would happen? What would it look like to you know? What would be the findings that I would observe if my hypothesis were proven to be false? Okay, and both outcomes need at least theoretically, in principle, to be possible. Um, then, of course, it's retrieving the data, extracting the features from the corpus data that will allow this hypothesis to be tested, and then evaluating that data with respect to the hypothesis. So um, in the case of this made up example I just discussed with intensification, then you searching for uh, linguistic features that uh, potentially uh, involve intensifying as a function. Um, and then you'll be evaluating that data by comparing the rate of that usage among male uh, speakers or writers versus female speakers or writers, for example, and, you know, if overall there's more of it for the females and the males, then that would probably, that would support your hypothesis. If not, then it would not support your hypothesis, right? It would falsify your hypothesis. So that that is the broad sort of principle. In practice, I would say, and I'm included in this, most researchers in corpus linguistics do this, but they don't do it explicitly. So they don't it's very rare that you'll see people writing about their research process using this terminology. It's a lot more, uh, a lot of this stuff is done, I would say, but it's kind of, it's implicit, it's sort of assumed and people are not necessarily thinking about it explicitly in these terms. So if you read research that uses corpus methods, don't expect very often to see it expressed like this in terms of our hypothesis of this. These are our dependent variables and independent variables, blah, 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 blah. It's it's a lot more kind of informal in that sense or implicit, and I and I'm the same. You know, reading this kind of framework, for example, by Stefanovic and reading the work of McKenna and Brezina, I recognize a lot of my own research process in it. But I also recognize that I don't really talk about it in this way so explicitly. And I think it's potentially a good idea to to do so. Uh, and and I will try to do more so, do this more in in the future. So yes, uh, I mentioned earlier that I'll be looking at a case study. Um, and this case study is a paper by uh, Baker, 2023. It just came out a few weeks ago. Um, and this is uh, a, nice, a nice sort of case study to look at because it doesn't require lots of kind of um, the practical sort of input that you will be getting in the rest of this week. You know, it doesn't require that stuff first. Um, although you may well appreciate this paper more once you've had that sort of practical input in terms of the, the techniques in analyzing corpus data. But for now, um, this paper is a, a year to remember, introducing the BE21 corpus and exploring recent part of speech tag change in British English. Um, if you're not familiar, well, I'll introduce the corpus in a moment, that's fine. Um, part of speech tag may be something you may or may not be familiar with, um, part of speech, of course, we're talking about word class. Um, so uh, whether a word is uh, a noun, for example, or a particular type noun or an adjective or a, a modal auxiliary or whatever. And a lot of corpora um, that are accessible to researchers um, are what's known as tagged according to part of speech. This is usually an, an automated uh, process of um, a computer program labeling every word in the corpus according to its part of speech. And programs over the last several decades have been developed to do this with a um, fairly high level of, of uh, reliability. 
Uh, and this then can be used in the process of corpus research to um, support the analysis by, you know, identifying words that are a particular word class, searching for words, or, or simply being better able to uh, search and analyze particular grammatical structures. Okay, so that's what I mean by a tag uh, and part of speech tag. Um, I'm sure that tagging and, and this sort of stuff and annotation, things like that, will come up more uh, in other sessions during the week. So I won't say much more about that for now, um, but uh, it's enough to help you understand the context of this of this study, okay? So what we're looking at here in this piece of research is um, it's about language change, okay? So we're, it's language change over the last century in written British English, okay? And so the BE21 corpus is, um, an example of a corpus that has uh, sampled a range of different genres of writing in British English. Um, and, oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button there, here we go. And this is a corpus, one of several, that is built using uh, the design of one of the first corpora, sort of widely accepted to be one of the first corpora ever built in, in the sort of modern definition of using computerized methods to help with the analysis of language data, the Brown Corpus that was uh, developed um, at Brown University in the United States of America in the 1960s. Um, and talking about introducing this corpus um, design is a good opportunity to kind of look at a real example of um, a corpus and the way that it's structured, okay? Um, and you will have in the tool that you'll be using this week, CQP Web, which I'll introduce in a little bit, um, corpora that have been built using this Brown model. There are several of them available for you to analyze in CQP Web. So I think, you know, having a bit of a sense of how these corpora are built will be helpful for you maybe a bit later in the week because you may get the chance to actually analyze these corpora specifically. OK, so the original Brown corpus is a one million word corpus of written American English, okay? As I said, it was built in the United States of America at Brown University in the 60s, and it's sampled from the early 1960s, okay? And the, the design is, is, you know, at the time, this was ridiculously ambitious to build a corpus of a million words. I don't think any of us truly have an appreciation of, of what doing academic research in linguistics would have looked like on a practical scale in the 1960s in terms of technology that didn't exist yet you know and and how long things took and the the size of the data sets that were were considered to be you know really big so you know i think it shouldn't be i think it's very easy for us nowadays to you know expect that there's just data everywhere and you know you could in a day very easily build a corpus of many more than a million words now based on internet texts right um this was a very different context. And so I think it has to really be appreciated that at the time that this was done, um, you know, when my mum was a baby, let alone when I was a baby, um, you know, a lot has changed since. So this was a big task and a, and a, a very impressive feat at the time to build this corpus. The design is um, quite interesting. <clears throat> it's got 500 texts, each 2000 words in length. So it, it consists of a lot of um, 2,000 word samples of larger texts, right? And they're from these, um, these particular text categories or genres. And so, for example, there is a lot of uh, fiction. Um, and so, as you, you know, as, as I'm sure you're aware, obviously, uh, novels are often much, much, much longer than 2,000 words long. And so there will be a 2,000 word sample of a, a novel, you know, included as part of the, 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 the corpus. And so um, some of these categories have been, you know, as time has gone on, you know, they've become a bit old fashioned and sort of criticized in terms of representativeness. But researchers, including Paul Baker, even as recently as this year, have, have continued to produce other corpora using exactly the same sampling frame, even if the, some of the categories are a little bit old fashioned and not so reflective of, of the general ways in which written English is used. Keeping the design the same does allow for comparison, you know, uh, and in this case, we're interested in diachronic analysis, which is the analysis of, of change over time, right? Um, and so 
you know, as I said, 500 texts, 2000 words each, uh, a million words. And the original one, as I said, was the Brown Corpus American Written English from the 1960s. Um, over time, as I said, other researchers started building additional corpora using the same sampling frame. And we ended up with a series of corpora of British English that use the Brown sampling frame. And similarly, in parallel, you have more corpora of American English that also use the Brown sampling frame. And um, we can talk about like the Brown family of, of corpora as well. There are lots of members of this family now, uh, including uh, a very recent edition, which is BE21. So these are the five corpora that Baker 2023 used in his analysis of part of speech tag change over time, right? And so you have one million, you know, there's five of them in total, one million words each, all using the same sampling frame. They have exactly the same proportion of written text from different genres of written English. In this case, these are all British English texts, right? And so we have a sample from 1931, um, that obviously was not collected in 1931, but many, many years later. But we have 1931, Blob, uh, 1931, 1961, Lob, um, Lob or L-O-B stands for Lancaster, Oslo, Bergen, the, the universities that work together to build the corpus. Um, 1991 is F-Lob or FLOB, which is the Freiburg, Lancaster, Oslo, Oslo, Bergen. Basically, all these letters, at least for the first three, are just names of universities that built them. And then we have, um, so the first three are 30 years apart, obviously. And then you we start to see 15 year gaps. And so the next one is from 2006, BEO6, which just actually stands for British English, actually. Um, and then 2021, which is BE or British English 21. OK, so we have these five corpora. The first three are 30 years apart. And then the last two are actually 15 years gap with the previous one. And they're all the same design, right? They all have the same proportion of text. and um, Paul Baker's study was interested in part of speech tags, which allows you really to access grammar to an extent. How have uh, part of speech tags uh, changed over time by comparing these five corporate of British English? OK, um, and this is informed by other research that has used previously members of the Brown family. Uh, Jeffrey Leach, who uh, was professor at uh, Lancaster University, um, sadly passed away nearly 10 years ago now. But, you know, his his mark uh, on the field um, is still felt much like uh, John Sinclair, who was um, at the University of Birmingham, also long deceased. But, you know, these these pioneering early figures in the field um, and and Leach uh, and colleagues looked at the earlier Brown uh, family uh, corpora from British English um, and noticed some trends that were changing in written English over time in the 20th century. Colloquialization, democratization, and densification. Basically, this is, you know, researchers kind of bringing together sets of features that have changed over time in their uh, frequency and come up with what is it that is, what is the broader process that appears to be going on? How can we group these features together in terms of how their frequencies have changed, whether they've gone up or gone down over time? And what do they all appear to be doing or what do they have in common in terms of function? And so you have uh, observations like colloquializ colloquialization, which is the idea that a lot of genres of written English are becoming less formal over time and becoming closer to the types of features that you typically find in spoken discourse, which is usually much less formal compared to written discourse. Um, democratization, which is essentially uh, an increasing um, respect paid to um, social equality and language awareness, I suppose, and sensitivity. And so, you know, in written genres of yesterday, uh, you'd often find the generic pronoun he used when describing, um, you know, any anyone basically, whether it whether it's a specific uh, when it's not a specific person. So you'll see in academic papers from earlier in the 20th century, people talking about if a researcher wishes to access my data, he can email me at whatever. You know, um, when actually nowadays you're much more likely to not have the generic male pronouns used, but um, a non-gendered pronoun like they, right? Um, or you sometimes get he slash she, you know, as, a, as another alternative of, of paying respect to, you know, issues of social equality. 
Uh, and then you have densification, which is um, again the, the sort of noticing that there are um, there are you know more information dense texts. So removal, lo, a, a decrease in what you might call flowery uh, language, and uh, more of an economizing kind of approach where um, you get um, declines of certain verbs that are uh, associated less with this, and a rise in um, nominalization, for example, and and other kind of condensing linguistic structures, right? So these are some of the things that Baker had in mind already in terms of what might be going on now when I compare these corpora and look at BE21. This is an example of an inductive approach, which is to be compared to deductive that I mentioned before. This is, it's not the case that Baker began the study with a specific hypothesis of, you know, some things are going up or some things are going down. Certainly not in terms of how it's reported in the paper. If you spoke to him, he might disagree and say, oh, actually, I did have a very clear hypothesis, but it wasn't presented in that way in the research. And that's what I'm going off here. This is presented as an inductive um, process. What I mean by induction is that we start with the data, really. We don't have a particular question that we're asking other than a very broad one of, how is the language changing? It's not the same as saying, I, you know, British English is becoming more, you know, X over time, or this particular linguistic feature is used more or less by whatever. It's, it's an open exploratory question um, of, let's just explore the data and see what we find. And um, <clears throat> from a scientific perspective, this is slightly harder to, uh, justify in terms of the idea of replications, uh, ideas of replication of, of falsifiability, um, as discussed in some of the, the sources I've, discussed, I've mentioned already. But it is actually quite common in corpus linguistics. A lot of my research is more, more inductive than deductive. It is a lot more like, let's just explore the corpus and see what, see what we find, see what might be different compared to another data set. It's, quite, it's not so common that I will go in with the kind of deductive approach of I've got an idea, a, a hypothesis, and now we're going to test it. Um, it you know, it does you know, it it does actually account for quite a lot of the sort of research. I think there's a a related discussion that that is relevant, and that is a distinction between so-called corpus-driven analysis as opposed to corpus-based analyses, and the idea that either you go in and there's a specific word that you want to search for and see how it's used, or you kind of just apply some of the processes that you'll learn about this week, for example, um, you know, looking at frequency lists, which is, I think you'll be looking at them tomorrow, um, and allowing the data to kind of reveal to you which things are interesting and kind of developing your research questions once you're already looking at the data. And so this is the kind of approach here, and it's a very common approach in, in, in corpus linguistics. I think the argument by people like McHenry and Brezina and Stefanovic is that we that there should be more uh, deductive corpus research that is easier to kind of test in terms of scientific principles. Um, but I think there is a value in, in uh, exploratory research approaches. The reason why I think there is so much inductive research and probably an increasing amount of inductive research in corpus linguistics is because you have so many really big publicly available uh, corpus uh, data sets available. Um, and because they're so big and because they're usually freely available to researchers, it encourages people to just explore, you know, play with the data, see what you find, go in with an open mind, don't restrict yourself to a particular question, you know, just go in and play. And, and so I think that that is sort of fueling this sort of approach. Anyway, uh, in my, my sort of interpretation, this is an example of uh, an inductive uh, corpus uh, approach. And um, it's looking at part of speech tags and basically comparing their frequencies over these five corpora. So it's a diachronic analysis. And uh, there's lots of stuff that, that Baker talks about. You can you know, look at the paper to read it, read more. I'm just gonna focus on this first finding here is that uh, the, the common noun, which is the, the tag that we're talking about here, um, for example, the word people, uh, is increasing, consistently increasing in frequency across these five corpora um, over time, right? You've got 1,861 instances in uh, 1931, 
And then by 2021, you've got 3,603. Notice here that Baker is only reporting raw frequency, as in these are, this is literally how many times does the word people occur in the corpus. Um, usually in a lot of corpus research, this is alone not a very good approach because um, corpora that you're comparing are usually not exactly the same size, right? And so you have to report relative frequency, which is the frequency that um, is normalized to account for the size of the corpus in total, yeah? So 1,861 doesn't mean anything if, you know, you don't sort of talk about that in relative terms to, well, how many opportunities theoretically did the word people have to occur? You know, what what is the proportion of uh, the word people compared to all the other words that are there in the corpus? However, in this case, these corpora are all the same size, probably not exactly, you know, to the to the to the token, but they're all very close to a million words. Uh, and in that context, it is it is reasonable that actually um, Baker <coughs> Baker is not reporting relative frequency because this is one of those rare cases where these frequencies are already relative by virtue of the corpora being all exactly or pretty close to a million words each. Um, so he's talking about the word people. Um, I'm not going to read all of this, but you can have a look You know, later. You've got the slides if you want to read more detail. But the gist of what he talks about when looking at the NN or the common noun tag um, is that people seems to be alone driving this, this increase in frequency. There's a lot, there's a you know, substantial increase in the use of the word people. And his interpretation is that this is associated with the process of democratization that I just mentioned before. The idea that language is um, changing along with societal changes around, uh, you know, human rights, I suppose, equality, um, uh, being more inclusive to minority groups that have been historically heavily uh, discriminated against, things like that. Um, and so this is sort of one of one of the, the, the findings of the research that there is more of this going on, um, uh, an increasing variety of people of particular categories that have been potentially um, discriminated against or stigmatized historically and you know, still to this day, sadly, in some cases. <clears throat> and that this is part of this, you know, evidence of how society has changed over the last century. Um, so in terms of what we might do, uh, if we take inspiration from this paper, um, you know, we might come up with a deductive corpus research question that, you know, tests this finding um, against a different type of data, right? And so you'll notice, as I said, the brown sampling frame, the brown corpora is just written genres of language. There's nothing um, that is, you know, transcribed speech, okay? And so we've ignored spoken language, for example. Um, and so what, you know, let's assume, let's imagine that we want to see whether or not this particular finding about people as part of a process of democratization is true also for spoken uh, British English, uh, specifically casual conversation. Is it the case that we also see an increase uh, in the frequency of the word people over time in spoken British English? And so we can kind of, in that kind of particular context, we can apply the, the framework that Stefanovich put forward of, uh, you know, coming up with a deductive research question where we are um, putting forward a hypothesis and testing that hypothesis and either supporting it or falsifying that hypothesis. So the object of research broadly is, you know, the construct of spoken British English. Um, the research question involves uh, a dependent variable. In this case, we're looking not at all of the parts of speech or even not even all of the nouns, just the specific noun people um, as an example. And our independent variable is time, right? So we, we, you know, we are isolating the independent variable of time and comparing, we need to compare corpora of spoken British English that are more or less the same uh, in terms of all the other variables or, or comparable as closely as possible and comparing it over time. Um, so uh, the, the, the hypothesis that we might come up with might be something like, Spoken British English has undergone democratization similarly to written British English as demonstrated by increased usage of the common noun people. You know, that that might be our general hypothesis. It's like, yes, we think this is probably also happening in spoken English too. Um, 
obviously democratization can be seen in many features or demonstrated uh, or, or interpreted in many features. Uh, in this example, we're only going to look at one word. And so, you know, the fact that people might be more uh, frequent in a more recent corpus compared to an old one on its own, you know, in, in reality would not you know, be enough evidence to sort of say, yes, this is a evidence of democratization. In practice, we'd be looking at uh, lots of features, right? But for this, you know, just to demonstrate the principle, we're going to pretend that just this one word alone is evidence of uh, supporting or not the idea of democratization. And so we're going to search for the word people in uh, diachronic, you know, samples of spoken British English. And then we're going to evaluate the data that we retrieve uh, with respect to the hypothesis. So obviously, if the word people is more frequent in a more recent data set compared to an older one, then that might, you know, be, you know, su supportive of, of the hypothesis, right? And obviously, if there is no evidence of an increase, if it decreases, for example, or even if it's more or less similar, relatively, then we can't support the hypothesis, right? Our, our um, hypothesis would be falsified. And so this is a research design that allows for, uh, and in fact, is testing against the principle of falsifying uh, the, 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 the hypothesis that we have. Okay. So keep that in mind, because I'm going to return to this in five minutes or so. Um, but before we actually look at this data and ask this question, I want to just kind of briefly zoom out again a little bit and talk about data and tools, of course, right? Um, and again, this is uh, only a brief introduction. You will be more, for, you know, in, in detail sort of introduced to a particular tool, CQP Web, this week. But just briefly to kind of uh, set the scene a little bit in terms of uh, the context, um, there are, when you read corpus literature, there is, um, you know, a lot of discussion about different types of corpora and, and there are different ways of categorizing them. Um, a lot of them are much less commonly used than the kind of two major types that I would put forward. So really for, for the posters of today, I think it is sufficient to say that there are two major types of, of corpora. Um, a general corpus, also known as a, sometimes as a reference corpus or it can be used as a reference corpus, is a corpus that is sampled to be representative of an, an entire language variety, um, not specific to a particular communicative context. So, you know, um, uh, the Brown corpus, for example, the original one is, is a general corpus in that it is supposed to represent general written American English. And the way that they do it is to take lots of little samples from lots of different genres to try to represent, you know, a broad spectrum of how that language uh, is used, right? So it's not specific to a particular genre um, or context or topic, but it's it's meant to be a general corpus of like this is the language as a whole, or this is the language variety as a whole. Um, contrasting with that is uh, a specialized corpus, and as the name implies, this is much more of a narrowly defined corpus, um, and often uh, a corpus that is built by a particular researcher who has a particular question that they want to answer. And so um, you see specialized corpora being used in a lot of uh, disciplines within uh, corpus linguistics, for example, discourse analysis. This would be a context, for example, where you're going to you know, investigate how a particular topic is uh, represented or discussed in you know, newspaper reporting. And so you, you're going to build a corpus of newspaper articles about a topic you know, in a certain time period, in a certain uh, language in a certain country, you know, you'll have lots of sort of quite specific criteria and your corpus will be highly representative, hopefully, of a narrowly defined domain. It is not a good representation of the language as a whole because there's a lot of contexts that are not included, but it's very good at focusing in on a really specific context. That's the distinction really between a general corpus and a specialized corpus. Many corpora that are provided for you when they are provided as part of corpus tools are general corpora. The idea being that you might yourself find or build a specialized corpus yourself and upload it to the tool and compare it against the general corpus to um, find out what is unique or particularly interesting um, or salient in your specialized corpus. In terms of tools, 
Again, this is quite a, a, a challenging thing to summarize because there are so many, right? Uh, I've included a link to a recently compiled list of Corpus tools, and um, uh, you have the slides, you can access that link, um, and, and you can scroll through and, and see all of the variety that there is in terms of language as well. Um, as I said, my own work is, is in English, and so I have I am acknowledging my English-centric approach in that I'm uh, highlighting a few tools that in the study of English are quite popular. That said, most, I'm not sure of all, but certainly most of these can uh, can work with more or less any, any language, right? Okay. Um, so it's not the case that these are not uh, applicable to other languages too. Um, there are tools that run, you know, in a, in a, in a browser on the internet. So they're not, software that you actually download onto your machine, but rather you just go online in your internet browser and you do all of the work inside the, the website of the tool and it's housed in a website, basically. CQP Web, uh, the Lancaster server of CQP Web is a tool you'll be using this week. Um, and so I'm gonna sort of end the session in a little bit by uh, giving you a, a preview, I guess, of, of that tool um and helping you to get logged into that tool if you so that you're ready for the practical work that you'll be doing this week um uh and a, a login uh, account a, a account has been created for you by uh the dips calling uh, team but i just wanted to mention a few other sort of quite um popular uh, uh corpus tools that are available online um english corpora i would say obviously as the name implies is you know only uh providing access to corpora of, of English. Um, but uh, I, I want to mention Sketch Engine. This is a, a brilliant online uh, tool that has a, probably the biggest kind of repository of uh, corpus data and in the biggest variety of languages, okay? Uh, they have highly sort of multilingual, uh, diverse range of corpora that are available to users as part of Sketch Engine. And it also allows you to upload your own corpus data to compare that uh, to the, the general reference corpora that are there. Um, Sketch Engine is, is not, uh, well, it's not inherently sort of freely accessible. Um, academic uh, institutions like universities um, can, um, they can uh, uh, sort of have institutional access. And so uh, if you decide to explore Sketch Engine at any point, have a go at logging in with your university uh, details, um, your university username or email address and password to, to see whether your institution already has um, access. Um, it does have a free preview version, which uh, can give you access to some of the data. But um, if you if you do have access to it, I, I would recommend it. W Matrix is an interesting one uh, developed at Lancaster University. Um, it's not so commonly used compared to the others I'm mentioning here, but I wanted to mention it because it does have a feature that is really fun and interesting, which is uh, semantic tagging. And so I mentioned part of speech tagging earlier, which is about automatically classifying every word according to word class. W matrix can do that, but it can also classify according to semantic categories, sort of a broader lexical field. Um, and um, that can be uh, very interesting. There are lots of uh, pieces of uh, desktop software that you do, you know, download and install onto your own uh, computer. Um, again, there are lots of these. There are three sort of ones that are, seem to be particularly popular these days, AntConk, Langsbox, and Wordsmith Tools. Um, AntConk and Langsbox are free to download um, to anyone. Uh, Wordsmith Tools does require a, um, uh, well, there is a free version actually that is unlicensed that has some limitations on, so you can get it for free. And you can get a, a, a license for for a payment. Um, again, these are mostly more for you know researchers who have their own data that they've collected, um, but they do offer some preloaded sort of reference corpora. But it's mostly uh, intended for people who have got their own data, compared to the online tools that are more more often providing access to existing corpora. So just to remind you of. A few moments ago, the question that we left off with, which was we're going to explore the use of the word people uh, over time in spoken British English. This is just a reminder. I've already talked through this, so I won't say any more about it. Just remind you of to demonstrate, uh, you know, a little bit of what it looks like in practice. 
um, we're, we're going to investigate this research question and test our hypothesis in uh, some data. Uh, the data that I um, have selected for this demonstration are two corpora of spoken British English, uh, both from the British National Corpora. Uh, the original BNC or British National Corpus was compiled in the 1990s. In total, it's a 100 million word sample of British English from a range of written and spoken genres. We're not looking at the whole thing, but rather a subsection of the BNC that um, is 5 million words in size. Um, I'm just going to close my window because I can hear a lawnmower outside and it's quite loud. So give me one second. Sorry about that. Um, hopefully you'll be able to hear me better now. Um, and then the thing we're comparing it to is uh, the spoken component of the newer BNC that was compiled a few years ago um, by a team of researchers at Lancaster, including me. Um, and Cambridge University Press. And both uh, of the spoken British National Corpora are available as preloaded reference corpora in uh, the following tools, CQP Web, Sketch Engine, and Langsbox. And it's also possible to download the files from these corpora uh, for use in other tools as well. Because both of these are in CQP Web, it means that we can ask our question of these two data sets, comparing the 1990s to the 2010s. Um, Obviously, this is not the same as the Brown uh, study by uh, Baker, because he's got five corpora over a longer stretch of time. Um, comparing five corpora over time does allow for a more reliable um, assessment of change compared to comparing just two sampling points, because obviously the more sampling points you have over time, the more you can actually see the trend, right? Um, looking at only two corpora and comparing over time is, is your, your findings have to be uh, more tentative because you don't really have evidence of, of a trend necessarily, which is really what we're interested in. But the reason why we're only looking at these two is because these are you know, the only two corpora that are intended to be comparable in this way. And this is to do with the fact that spoken language historically has been less commonly uh, considered in corpus linguistics because it's harder to collect transcribing and all these practical issues that make it harder and more expensive to gather. So this is to finish the, I know this has not been very practical so far. We're gonna finish with a little bit of practical work, um, really to introduce you to the tool you'll be using for the rest of this week, which as I said, is CQP Web at Lancaster. Um, I think uh, I think Prehantor also already very helpfully um, put the username and password. Um, it's also here on the screen. So if you haven't already, uh, if you're able to uh, live, you know, uh, while you're listening to me talk, if you're able to access the, the link there to the CQP web website um, and log in using the username and password that you can see uh, on my slides, but also in the chat, then I'd like you to do so right now. Uh, and we'll spend a few minutes having a quick look at um, the word people in these two corpora. Um, because the uh, username and password are very helpfully in the chat, I'm going to move on to the next slide because you don't need it on the screen because I want to show you the instructions for what you're gonna do. This is a very quick task. Um, it doesn't involve really any actual analysis because you'll be learning about different techniques for corpus analysis this week. So this is very quick and kind of just a, an impressionistic look. Um, I'm gonna try to kind of both keep the instructions on the screen and also do it sort of live alongside with you so that if you either if you're unsure or if you are not able to access uh, the browser you know, the, the tool right now, um, for whatever reason, then you'll still see it happening. Okay, so I'm going to switch uh, very quickly into my uh, browser, and I'm going to bring up um, what am I looking for? Where is it? Yes, okay. So, um, oh, yeah, I'm going to put it side. Yeah, I'm going to put it here. So you can see the slide and can you see, can I just check you can see the browser or am I just actually sharing the slides themselves as opposed to the screen? We can see the browser, Robbie. You can, you can, yeah. yeah. Good, okay, brilliant, thank you. Thanks for confirming. I couldn't remember whether I just said the slides themselves or, or the screen actually. So, as I said, um, you'll be getting to grips with CQP Web in a lot more detail 
in uh, the, the other sessions this week. This is a very quick introduction. We're first going to look at the 1990s corpus. And um, in your list, you might not have these recent use things up here or not, but you, you're interested in the, the British National Corpus XML edition. What you can see in front of you is the, the initial kind of search page. And so the main principle is if you have a particular word that you're looking for, then you can type it in here and search for it and you'll find all the examples and you'll be able to do some analysis. Um, however, uh, as I said, the, the British National Corpus as a whole contains lots of written texts and other types of spoken texts that we're not interested in. So actually, we don't want to search for the word people in the entire corpus. We want to search for the word people in the specific part of the corpus that we are interested in. So we need to click on restricted query. And uh, for the purposes of this task, uh, we are only interested in what is called the spoken demographically sampled part. This is the 5 million word uh, sample of casual conversation transcripts that we're talking about. So all I have to do is click there, and that will restrict our search only to this 5 million word conversational part that we're interested in. OK. Oh, where has it gone? Thank you. Um, once you've ticked that box, then it is as simple for this task um, as an introduction as searching for the word people and clicking start query. And this is what you should find. And hopefully, if you are doing this alongside me, uh, live, then you will have also seen the same screen that I'm seeing right now. And um, you will learn, you know, about what's going on here in these sessions as a very brief introduction, the basic view that you have. Uh, at the top, you have some frequency information. So if you've done, if you followed my instruction correctly, you should, it should say that it's returned 4,691 matches in 146 different texts in uh, 5 million or so words uh, with a frequency, a relative frequency of 935 per million, okay? Um, this here is, again, a bit of a preview for remainder of the sessions. You'll be learning more about this in, in lots of depth uh, with practical exercises. These are what are known as concordance lines. So this is uh, every single example, every single individual example of the word people in the data set that you've searched for. In total, as I said, there's over four and a half thousand of them. You've got the first 50 here, um, but you could click through and there's 94 pages of this. So you could look at all of them if you want. Approaches to looking at concordance lines. Again, you'll get more on that later in the week. But this is just to contextualize what you're seeing here. OK, good. OK, so now that you have um, found people in the BNC uh, spoken part from 94, we also need to look uh, in the new part, as I said, which is um, the spoken BNC 2014. In this case, uh, we don't need to restrict the corpus because this is presented differently uh, in this tool. This is already just the spoken conversational part, okay? Uh, this, the way that this corpus is presented is just the spoken conversation part on its own. So we don't actually need to restrict here because we already are only looking at the bit that we want. So this part is easier because we can just on the standard query immediately type in the word people and search for it. Similarly, you'll get, you know, it's a different color, um, but uh, you get the same output in terms of frequency information and concordance lines. What you should have found if you followed this instruction is 23,010 matches, okay? And so I'll return to the slide uh, to kind of interpret what we find. If you, um, if you have uh, followed these instructions, you should have come out with these uh, comparison, th this frequency information. Remember, in this case, unlike the brown corpora that Paul Baker looked at, these corpora are different sizes. The BNC 2014 spoken part is over double the size of the corpus we're looking at within the original BNC. So this comparison of the raw frequencies, 4,691, 23,010, is not an appropriate basis on which to say which has a higher frequency uh, in one corpus compared to the other. This has to be normalized. We have to have frequency that is relative to the size of the whole corpus, essentially a percentage. But in this case, instead of it being out of 100, it's out of a million um, for reasons that will probably be explained further in other sessions. 
for the sake of time, I'll just say that the relative frequency for the 1994 corpus is 935. The relative frequency for the newer one is 2014. So it's um, basically the, the, the overall uh, finding here is that the word people is over twice as frequent in the newer version compared to the older one. Again, um, going back to our hypothesis, spoken British English has undergone democratization, similarly to written British English, uh, as demonstrated by increased usage of the common noun people, then on that basis, yes, there is uh, an increase in the frequency of the word people. So we would support that hypothesis. Of course, in practice, we would only we would not only be asking that question of the word people necessarily in terms of the generalization to democratization, but for the demonstration of this, uh, this task, this would be one way of very, um, uh, in, a, in a kind of simple way, of getting a sense of uh, diachronic uh, comparison of two corpora and kind of demonstrating that process of coming up with a hypothesis, in this case, based on reading someone else's research and going, oh, I wonder if that's also true in a different context. And I think it is, is my hypothesis and testing that hypothesis. OK, as I said, uh, you will be using CQP Web a lot this week in practical uh, sessions. Um, it is also possible to upload your own corpus data to CQP Web. I don't have time to go through that process with you, but there are instructions here that you're very welcome to try doing uh, in your own time. You may well get to do it this week, depending on what the other uh, tutors who are teaching this week have got planned for you in the practical activities. But it is possible to upload your own corpus data uh, to CQP Web. OK. Um, I do want to finish in time for, to have at least a few more minutes um, for uh, for some final questions, because I know there are more questions in the chat. Uh, and yes, thank you, uh, Pri and Tora, for, um, for noting that if you do create your own user account for CQP Web, which you can do for free, then um, you do need to, to access the Spoken BNC 2014. You do need to uh, follow a little bit of additional instruction to sign the license. Um, We've already registered the Spoken BNC for the uh, for the summer school uh, account, so you don't need to do it for that. Um, so you can log in and, and, and play with it. But if you do it with your own account, then you will need to follow the instructions. But it only takes 30 seconds. It's very easy to do. OK, so to conclude our first session, um, I've tried to kind of give you a, a broad, mostly theoretical introduction to the whole point of Corpus Linguistics. And, um, and I'm trying to kind of show that it's not necessarily just about really fancy statistical stuff that can be involved and you'll learn a bit about that probably on Thursday most of most of all when you look at collocation um at its heart it is about doing the sort of stuff that you might already be doing looking at language looking at text on a bigger scale okay um and corpus linguistics has grown really in, to a great extent over the last decades and uh the fact that this summer school is happening is, is, is one example of, of the evidence of that in terms of there being increased interest from uh, an increasing number of researchers and students around the world in this stuff. Um, there are lots of tools that are available. Um, they're, uh, uh, you know, a double edged sword in a way. They're great in that a lot of them are freely available. There's lots of data sets that are freely available as well. Um, so lots of, you know, corpus linguistics has never been more accessible than it is presently. However, that also does mean that there are more people who might be doing this stuff without fully appreciating a lot of the methodological issues and challenges and limitations of the work and having an awareness of the assumptions you're making uh, of the data is really important in terms of doing good research essentially and, and this is always something that is improving over time as well. You'll be using CQP Web this week as I briefly demonstrated to explore corpus data and um, you've already had an overview, obviously. I just wanted to kind of sort of show how I think things will fit in. Uh, tomorrow, you'll be looking with uh, Andresa Gomija, looking at uh, corpus query techniques. Um, so how do you search for stuff beyond just typing in a word and pressing go? As I showed a very simple example, there are other ways of asking more complex questions and searching for more complex things. Uh, Wednesday, you'll be looking at Concordance analysis and frequency lists with Peter Crosswick. Thursday, collocation, the relationships between words. And then Friday will be more of a demonstration of the uh, applications of 
corpus methods in a particular uh, context. Um, okay, so to finish, uh, there are lots of resources out there. Um, if you'd like to hear more about what I'm doing uh, in, in corpus linguistics, then I actually host a podcast uh, where I interview corpus researchers around the world, uh, Corpus Cast, um, and there are lots of guests uh, who've come on and talked about their research, including some of the people that I've been citing today. Um, we also have a, a corpus linguistics research group at Aston University. We recently announced that we'll be uh, co-hosting the next uh, International Corpus Linguistics Conference uh, in two years' time. Um, and there are other, of course, summer schools. If you want to, you know, you do the summer school, great, I want to do another one. Then Lancaster has one, University of Birmingham has one. You know, there are lots of resources online to learn more about corpus linguistics. Um, and I've included on the side some, you know, books, basically, that, that I've mentioned or others that I think might be particularly helpful. Um, but again, you don't need to note this down because you have the slides already. So I will finish there and say thank you, which I think leaves us with five minutes uh, for me to try and answer some of the questions you have. I appreciate that. I'm not going to have time to get through all of them. But uh, yeah, thank you. You know, I hope that this was a useful introduction, uh, and I and I really hope that you enjoy the summer school. It's been an honor to to be involved with with the first one of its kind, and thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, yes, I, I hope this was uh, helpful and, and interesting in some way. Um, hello, Dr. Robbie. Hello? Oh, hello, hello. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was, uh, Dr. Sub, that was a wonderful session. We learned a lot, actually. It was very informative and innovative, and I really enjoyed this uh, session of yours. Uh, but there is a couple of questions, especially the questions you, you talk about, I mean, the the online sources and tools actually for English specific languages, even American English and British English. So uh, are there tools that process, I mean, other Asian languages, including languages from Pakistan, Indonesia and other? Because uh, we have smart departments here in this part, you know, where we are doing some researches with our students regarding different things, especially discourse analysis. And mostly we, in discourse analysis, we mostly make them do analyze actually the fam speeches which are in English, but we want to analyze something especially in all languages where we find it very difficult to find, I mean, tools which can help us to analyze. So do you have uh, any knowledge of any such online tool which can, uh, you know, help us to analyze our indigenous languages especially? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a great question. Um, I, I well, yes is the short answer. Um, I, I believe. Uh, well, I know Priyantora. I know you you were involved, obviously, with, with CQP Web while you were at, at Lancaster, and I believe there's uh, some Indonesian data in 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 CQP Web. I may have made that up, but um, uh, I, I remember at some point hearing about that. Sketch Engine, as I mentioned, has uh, data from from lots of lots of different languages. Um, and, and and also, you know, a, a lot of these tools can process uh, data from from a lot of a lot of different languages too. Um, it, you know, it may be the case, as as you point out, that if, if it is harder for you to find data in particular uh, indigenous languages, it might be because there is less of it already uh, existing. Um, you know, relative to to some other languages. Uh, you know, in which case it's it's more of a justification to build, you know, to to gather data uh, and build more corpora. But um, I'm not sure, Pri, you can say anything uh, more on on your work with CQP Web. I, I may have just made that up. If, if I have, then I apologize. But um, I'm not sure if you can comment on 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 Indonesian uh, corpus data more specifically. No, uh, actually, I'm from Pakistan. You know, I'm actually. I'm a Pashto speaking uh, person. Uh, I'm, I'm also, uh, I also know Urdu and, you know, uh, some other local language. I was actually talking for Matt. Anyhow. Oh, I see. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Well, I, I think this, the, same, the same principle applies. I mean, um, I, I know that there has been corpus research on uh, Urdu. I think um, Andrew Hardy at Lancaster University has done uh, research on, on, on several, uh, several languages, uh, but... Um, but yes, I, the, the, the same principle uh, applies, really, I think. This is a this is good answer. Uh, how can we have, I mean, the slides and all these things? So kindly request, I mean, the uh, moderators or even the coordinators of this conference yeah, you know, yeah, the, to share the, the with slide, us. 
this yes this uh, the slides will be will be provided yes yeah you you will get you will be able to download the the, the slides yeah uh, thank sorry, you thank, the, thank the you, slides everybody. are already available in oh, the okay. google drive so last night i have uh shared the link of the google drive which will consist of all the materials from all the speakers including access to sick and other uh useful materials so yeah, you can just need to check your emails and then click on the link. Uh, the materials will be there, including the link uh, for today's recording. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I'm good. sure that yeah, people are uh, curious. Uh, they still have a lot of questions, but unfortunately, uh, we don't have much time uh, left, Robbie. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me hand it over to the moderators. Okay, thank you, Mr. Prihantura. So, unfortunately, uh, the delegates, our time is up. And thank you very much, Dr. Robin Lopes, for enthusiasts and engaging sessions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, if there is there is have questions, you can send him by emails. Let's give a round of applause for Dr. Robin Lopes. And thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your, your time. And uh, yes, apologies, we run out of time. But um, if you do have further questions, you're, you're very welcome to, to, to get in touch. But uh, yeah, thank you, everybody, uh, for, for attending today. And thank you for inviting so, me as well. OK, uh, now that we have distributed the, at the at attendance list for the sessions, if you have not marked down your attendance, please do so. We will let the form open for a few minutes. As for tomorrow's sessions, we will be joined by Dr. Andres Gomide from Universidade de Coimbra, Portugal. Make sure to join before 3 p.m. Jakarta time tomorrow to avoid Zoom administration code. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. See you tomorrow. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Robbie. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Robbie. Everyone. Thanks. Do you uh, do you want me to stay just to say hello quickly, or I'm I'm very happy if you want to have a quick chat after after people have gone. <laughs> no, uh, uh, no, Dr. Robbie, you can leave the. Okay, room. that's fine. Okay, uh, great. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you.